So we're, we're looking at Nehemiah chapter uh, 11, and we'll finish in chapter 13 uh, today uh, as well. But when you step into what we've been going through, the book of Nehemiah, it, it's in the Old Testament. And, and what you see uh, as Nehemiah comes on the scene, and Nehemiah, who writes this, uh, he was a cupbearer to the king of Persia, this very trusted position uh, that he had. And when you think of the nation of Israel, this is a nation uh, where at this point, it's been like 500 years of, of rebellion and idolatry. Uh, in other words, this is a nation that that every time they do something right, they, they, they do something wrong, and they continue to struggle in following God, uh, obeying God. Uh, and then we also uh, see that the condition of these people continues to just go downhill. Uh, the condition of the city of Jerusalem, which was to be the headquarters, the capital, right? The, the, the view of who God uh, was to the known world. And we see the nation, uh, the walls crumbling down. We see the people who at one point were uh, in, um, in cap- they were cap, I was going to say captivated. They were, but they were captive. For 70 years and, and during uh, that time as well. And so it has been a rough, rough stretch. And so we're introduced to this guy who is in Persia, Nehemiah, and he gets word at the state of Jerusalem. And, he, and he's a Jew, and so these are his people. And he hears about the state of the walls and the city and the people, and his heart breaks over what he hears. He's burdened. And, and in the midst of that uh, burden that he has for the people, we read how he repents for the people, but also he repents of his own sins, his own areas of weakness. And then he goes to the Lord, and he just fasts, and he prays, uh, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And it's through that time that God says, you're going to go back there and you're going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah approaches the king by faith and shares this incredible God-sized vision. And the king not only encourages him to do it, but the king funds the mission. And Nehemiah goes back and over the course of 52 days, they build this two and a half mile long wall. Remarkable. And last week, we looked at verse, uh, chapters 8 through 10, and we saw how not only did the people that surrounded the nation of Israel marvel and go, oh my goodness, only God could have done that. But then we saw how the people themselves in Israel go, only God could have done this. And in chapters 8 through 10, we see revival t- take place. We see the people acknowledging that, that, that God and only God could have done this. They're craving God's word and they're, and they're responding to God's word as it's read. And you just see this incredible revival. And it's like 500 years gone in like 52 days. And, and, and so we're, we're just excited about what's happening here, what's going on with the people. And then we get to chapters 11 and 12 and there's a bunch of names. Almost two full chapters of names. Names that I'm sure later today you are going to read. Every single one of them. And so the question is why, right? Why in the midst of this revival do we have this moment here in chapter 11 where we, and, and 12 where it's just a whole bunch of names? Uh, and, and this is what we find out in Nehemiah chapter 11. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. It says, now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of 10 to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of 10 remained in the other towns and the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Okay, so what we see is is the walls are finished, right? The, The gates of Jerusalem are restored. But what was important was that then the people would move back into the city and repopulate the city. The problem is nobody wanted to do that. Right, so they build this 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 amazing wall, right? Like like they're they're celebrating revivals taking place, and then they're like, okay, so who's gonna live here? Are are you gonna live there? They're gonna live there. No one wanted to live there, 
And so here they are at this, at this place and they're like, we, well, people have to live here. Like the city has to re- be repopulated. We have to have people living here, functioning and thriving in this society. Uh, guys, this is the glory of God, the image, the view to all of these other nations. And, and, and so nobody volunteers uh, at that moment. So Nehemiah is like, all right, we're going to draw straws. And whoever's got the shortest straw, you're moving into the city, right? And, and literally, he, he, instead of like a tithe of money, they tithe the people. A tenth of all the people in the surrounding villages are told you're moving in, right? So, so they're, they're starting to repopulate the city. But what I love here is in chapter two, we see uh, highlighted that there are these people who chose to move back into the city. These people that volunteered to move back in. And these are the people that it's, it's acknowledging. And, and literally Nehemiah is, is, is saying, man, I, I just wanna acknowledge and praise the move that they did because these individuals were pursuing God's will over their own safety and their own prosperity. Guys, why did no one wanna move back in uh, to the city? Well, man, the conditions were awful. If you don't remember, uh, the people were poor. The conditions were awful in the city. That You don't change that in 52 days, right? So that still there. And then to make matters worse, there's been a lot of opposition already. And and so if any opposing army is going to come into that region, where do you think they're going to attack? The city. So there was a lot of fear associated with living in the city as well. And so nobody wanted to live there. But then we see in verse two, Nehemiah wants to highlight the fact that, hey, there's people that literally put their own safety, their own prosperity, right? Because they're leaving their land as well to go and to live in Jerusalem. Yeah, there's a lot of names. But these names represent people who gave up their lives in order to follow God's will. And guys, I, I want to challenge us with this. Never underestimate the importance of simply being physically present in the place that God has called you to be. Never underestimate that. So often we highlight these, these heroes of the faith, these, these people that did all these things or the, or the best story, right? Or, or people with the most giftings and, and we highlight them, we look to them and, and, and so often we neglect or fail to acknowledge so many people that are having a dramatic impact, so many people that are having a huge impact in our church. Do you know how many people right now are, 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 are literally discipling our kids right now? And they're not sitting there, uh, you, you know, going, oh, I'm the best teacher in the world. They're just choosing to physically be present and consistent in our kids' lives. We see that in, our, in, our, in the ministries at our church. And, and guys, I, I just think that we've kind of shortchanged that, the power of you just being present consistently in someone's life. And knowing that if God's called you to be there, he's gonna make a difference as you follow him and are obedient in that. And for some of you that maybe you're like, man, I'm just not seeing the reward or the payoff of just being faithful, of being present. Uh, Maybe it's even your kids. Uh, Maybe it's in a ministry. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's with a friend. And you're just like, man, I'm gonna be in their life. You guys, hold on tight. God is using you. God's using you. And so we, you know, you think about going to a a war memorial and if you go to a war memorial, you'll see a list of names, right? A whole bunch of names. And you guys, those names, uh, those names are there and you could be, man, there's a lot of names here, but those names have meaning, don't they? And so he's listing these names, but these are people who are really, really important. And so in chapter 11, verses three through 24, he highlights these people that moved into the city of Jerusalem. Then we see in verses 25 through 36 of chapter 11, uh, those in the surrounding villages. And then in chapter 12, verses one through 26, you see these priests and these Levites, some of whom left other countries to come back and to volunteer to live there, to serve the people spiritually. And you just see throughout this incredible respect given to the names on this list. Words like valiant men, men of valor, mighty men of valor are all words you see. You also see in here how uh, the king of Persia himself in chapter 11, verse 23, he helps support the ministry that was going to happen financially at the temple. But then we get to chapter 12, verse 
at verse 27, we get to the dedication of the walls, right? Let's celebrate. And in verse 27, it says, and at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals, harps and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the district surrounding Jerusalem and from the village of the Netephilites and also from Beth Gilgal and from the region of Geba and Asmapheth. For the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves and they purified the people and the gates of the wall. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall to the dung gate. And then in verse 38, it says, and the other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north and I followed them with half of the people on the wall above the towers of the ovens to the broad wall. And then in verse 40, he says, so both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God and I and half of the officials with me. And then in 43, it says, and they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Okay, so, so, so they all gather together, right? Um, the wall's been completed. Uh, the people are excited. They acknowledge only God could have done this. People are now moving back into uh, the city and they go, let's dedicate these walls, this city to the Lord. And it almost feels like a rededication of the nation as well. The city is back. And so they send for these Levites, these Levites that were ministering in all these local villages uh, around Jerusalem. They, they, they were like, hey, everybody's gathered. You got to come. You guys are gifted. You're singers, right? You're musicians. Uh, we're going to come together and we're going to dedicate the walls of Jerusalem. We're going to have this massive, massive worship service. And we see that they, they purify themselves first, these priests Uh, These spiritual leaders, uh, they purify themselves. They purify the gates and the walls. And what they were doing there before they worship was they were getting their hearts and their minds and their lives right with Christ before they worshiped. And and there's something about that that I just love. I think for for many of us, when we go into a time of worship, um, oftentimes if there's something in my life that's off, that's not right, Uh, there's maybe a a sin issue there. I find it difficult to fully engage with worship. Do you? And and, and sometimes it's like, I don't even know what it is, but I'm I'm, I'm just struggling fully engaging. And sometimes as we're singing in worship here, I'll just get caught up and I'll just start focusing on these words that we're saying to God. and, 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 And I'll just be like, man, does that really reflect what's going on in my heart? And you guys, when it doesn't, I struggle worshiping. I struggle engaging with God. And so I love how, how worship, you guys, like, like really nothing else, worship confronts you with where you're at with God. And I love how they're like, let's get, let's get ourselves right. Let's make sure things are where they need to be. And so they get themselves right. Then they go to God in worship. And then, and then I love what happens here. Nehemiah brings up the leaders and, and, and literally he, he's like, come on up. We're gonna go on top of the walls here. And so he brings up all the leaders, they're on top of the wall, and then he puts them into two groups, two choirs. He's going to be in one, and Ezra, who was the spiritual leader of the people, uh, he's going to be in the other. And and they're both going to be in these choirs, and the choirs are going to circle the city, they're going to meet at the temple, and they're going to have just this massive worship session to God. And so, and so literally everybody's on the wall. Now, what I love about this are a couple things. One is uh, remember the enemies when they were trying to rebuild the walls, the enemies were saying, hey, hey, a fox could jump on that wall and it would just crumble. Now, if I, me, was building the wall, that would be true. I am not a builder. No one's confused me for a builder. It's just never happened, right? Like, it's just nobody, when I walk into like Home Depot or Jerry's, they don't assume I know what I'm doing. It's like on my face. And, but they, but, but, but literally they, they were like, there's no way, this is a joke. The wall is a joke. And so here they are, all the leaders, they're on top of the wall, walking on the wall and they're marching the wall. 
celebrating. Now, if you, <laughs> I, I, this isn't in the text, but I think it might be there. We just haven't uncovered it yet. But, it, you know, when you think of the people, uh, you know, who, who helped build it, and, and I don't know if you've ever done a DIY project, but when you like look at what you've done, there's always that process of like, I hope this is right, right? If you've done a floor, you're like, come on, baby, please be right, you know? And, and I would just imagine that as these guys are, and, and, and they're all celebrating and walking the wall, I'm sure when it got to their section that they built, they were like, oh, please, Lord Jesus, I pray that this stands. <laughs> this is my section, right? And, but they're praising God, and they all rally together. Both groups comes together right before the temple, and they're just there praising God. God, this incredible dedication of the walls. And it says in verse 43, and I love this, the joy of Jerusalem was heard from afar. See, it wasn't just about walking the walls. It wasn't just about the demonstration of how strong we are now. It ultimately always went back to praising God. In Hebrews 13, 15, it says, through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. You you guys, we are called to continually worship him, to continually lift up his name. It should not be just a Sunday thing or when there's a worship service. Uh, This should be a daily part of our lives. And we see this nation is just going off here, excited, worshiping God. And then in 44, it says this, on that day, men uh, were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits and the tithes to gather into them the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites, according to the fields of the towns, for Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. And they performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did the singers and the gatekeepers, according to the command of David and his son Solomon. For long ago in the days of David and Asaph, there were directors of the singers and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah gave the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers. And they set apart that, which was for the Levites and the Levites set apart that, which is for the sons of Aaron. Now, if you're new, you're just sitting there going, what is going on? We're reading a lot, a lot of names. Bring me up to speed. Okay, so here's what Nehemiah is doing. They have just dedicated, they've celebrated and and, and sung and cried out to the Lord and said, God, only you could do this. This is yours. This is built for your purposes. But then what Nehemiah does here is he makes sure that this emotion that's happening, this incredible emotion turns into faithfulness. See, they're, 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 they're caught up in an incredible moment of praise, right? This defining moment. And, and, and Nehemiah in this is concerned about what? The continued obedience moving forward, right? right? Nehemiah's vision was never to start this, uh, never to, to have this, this become like a movement or just a fad that came and then went. No, he's establishing a new way of life moving forward for these people. And, and, and so um, as, as, he, as he continues, he, he literally says, what are the things that are needed to sustain this? What does it take to sustain what God is doing right now? And, and guys, you can all connect and relate to this because there's so many times where we have this powerful moment, right? Or we're there to celebrate something. I mean, you think of like a marriage ceremony, right? And I've had the privilege to do a lot of marriage ceremonies and, 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 and all of them, I, I, I don't look back at any of them and go, oh, that was, that was kind of garbage. Like maybe one, but other than that, all, it was, man, that was, that was my first one ever too. So, but <laughs> I'll never forget that. But it's a beautiful thing. You go and, and everybody celebrates, right? I've seen a ton of beautiful ceremonies and in horrible marriages. Why? What, what happened? Right? Well, well something changed from that incredible celebration, right? Some things changed. Some covenants that were said were broken, right? Some things that felt right in the moment when everything was was great and I'm in love, all of a sudden now the things that 
were required for faithfulness, for obedience to happen, for it to be honored, stop happening. And guys, that's the same thing that happens in our relationship with God. And so we have to ask, what will help sustain what God is doing in your life? What will help sustain it? And so for the people, it was going to be this continued commitment to give, to tithe, um, to bring their first fruits, to honor uh, the house of the Lord, right? They had made a covenant before God in chapter 10. We're gonna take care of the house of the Lord. And guys, as they're giving, the reason this is highlighted is the thing right here that will sustain the people, sustain what God is doing is because those tithes, those offerings were going to support the priests and the Levites who were taking and teaching God's word to all all of the people in Jerusalem and in the surrounding villages. So Nehemiah is like, this has to be a priority. If this ceases to become a priority, God's word ceases to go forth. People fail to be taught. They're not gonna be growing up. And we're gonna see the nation fall right back into rebellion like they were before. And so he says, this has to be a thing. And so in the midst of this celebration, he says, let's start doing this. Let's start tithing. Let's start bringing the gifts, uh, our, our, our first fruits. And, and, and guys, this is a byproduct always. I shared this last week. When God is moving, giving is always a byproduct. An excitement towards giving. When you look at scripture, nobody was like, oh, there you go. Because I'm supposed to. No. Oftentimes in scripture, you see him saying, stop, turn it off. Like you guys, man, you're, we're overwhelmed by what you've done. And so that was a natural byproduct. And so it was this great day in Jerusalem, this dedication. People are just bringing all of these gifts, these tithes and these offerings. Like like everybody is like, here we go. We're back. And guys, I wish the book of Nehemiah ended in chapter 12. I really do. It's the perfect ending. Unfortunately, there's a chapter 13. There's another page. There's another line. And unfortunately, we are referred to in scripture as sheep. And sheep are prone to wonder. And so we get to chapter 13. In chapter 13, verses one through three, it says this. And as we read this, you're gonna be a little confused because what it does is it brings us to an event that wasn't the next event, right? It, it, it brings us to an event that, that happened sometime later Um, But it's important that we read it and understand. In 13, we're going to read all of 13, okay? For some of you that are new, we typically don't read all of that, but you just need to hear what happened, okay? It's it's important. And so in chapter 13, uh, verses uh, 1 through 3, it says, On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, for they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Okay, so when we were going through chapter 10 last week, in chapter 10, The nation of Israel, as part of this revival, they go, moving forward, we're gonna make a covenant with you, God, and we're gonna focus on these areas that we've fallen short in. And the areas that they focus on, that they make a promise to God about, uh, one is we are going to stop intermarrying and mixing with nations that are in opposition to God. Nations that were actually into uh, worshiping other gods uh, that had been influencing the nation of Israel through marriage, through just proximity and connection, right? And so the nation of Israel was actually being led into idolatry through these relationships. And so one of the things they said is, God, we're going to stop with that. We're going to cut that off, right? And so they make a decision to do that. They also made a decision in regards to the Sabbath. They're going to, they said, we're going to honor the Sabbath. This day that the law has asked us to set aside to honor God, we're going to set that aside. And then lastly, we saw that they made this commitment that we are going to make our tithing and our giving focus. We're not going to neglect that. We're not going to neglect the house of God. But here we are brought into this scene where at some point later, the words of the law are being read. They're listening. And in their midst, they see, wait a second, it's happening again. 
There's people here that don't believe in God. There's people from other nations that are sitting here in this, what is going on? And they separate as they read this. And we're like, wait, how does this happen right after this worship uh, service, this dedication? And this is what we learn in chapter 13, verses four through nine. It says this, now before this, like, oh, so before those first couple of verses, it says, now before this, Eliashib, the priest who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king, and after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem, and I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. Okay, so this is what we need to understand. In chapter 13, between 12 and 13, Nehemiah has served as the governor, as the leader of Jerusalem for 12 years. Okay, so, so, so he's been this leader uh, for 12 years. And then, uh, and we know this from chapter two, he had made a promise. When he asked for permission to go back and rebuild the walls, he made a promise to the king that he would come back. The king said, when are you gonna come back? And so Nehemiah is honoring that promise. He goes back to the king between chapters 12 and 13. And, and we don't know how long he was gone. Could have been a year, could have been, could have been longer, Right? But, but as he's gone, we see every major thing that the nation of Israel said, we're gonna make a priority to honor God in. Every one of those areas was completely broken when he comes back. So he comes back and, and, and he sees that the walls, yes, the walls are still standing, but the lives, the spiritual lives of the people is completely broken down. And we're reminded of this individual who we've heard his name a few other times named Tobiah, Tobiah the Ammonite. And, and Tobiah, as if, uh, if you've been coming throughout this series, Tobiah uh, was one who was a leader in opposition to uh, the people, opposition to the, the walls being rebuilt, opposition to what God wanted to do there. And so Tobiah has been against it the whole time. Well, here's what's happened. Tobiah in some way, one of his family members has married into the high priest family. Which you're like, oh. Not only that, it gets worse. The high priest clears out a room where the tithes, the offerings was to go and he gives it to Tobiah to live in. Gives it to him as a room. So Nehemiah comes back, right? Uh, this is the house of God, right? This, and, and, and he walks in and all of a sudden he sees Tobiah has a room in the temple. Now, Nehemiah responds, and guys, as we read in this section uh, moving forward, you're gonna be surprised by how Nehemiah responds to some stuff. I'm gonna be honest. Some of you are gonna be either like horrified and then some of you are gonna be like, that's right, I like Nehemiah. But Nehemiah responds to this. He is, it, first, he's horrified and he sees this and he just starts, man, he's chucking furniture, right? He's chucking Tobiah's furniture out of the house. Um, and, 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 and then Tobiah, he's, he's, he's like, you're out, man. And it reminds me of Jesus in Matthew 21, right? When Jesus walks into the courtyard of the temple and he sees these merchants ripping people off, Jesus doesn't walk up to him and go, hey, so you probably shouldn't do that here. Yeah, I'm Jesus. So if you could just pack up and leave, that would be great. And I'll pray for you as you leave. No, Jesus goes, goes off, Right? Some of you are like, I don't know what happened. Jesus goes in there and he starts what? Flipping tables. Jesus, not my Jesus. Yeah. Jesus starts flipping tables. <laughs> He's got a whip. He's kicking people out. He's throwing them out. He's like, you are not going to defile the house of God. 
And so Nehemiah, he is going nuts in here. He gets him out and he's like, what is going on? And he reestablishes that the tithe and this room, it needs to be honoring the Lord. And, 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 and you have defiled all of that. And so he cleans house and he finds out that not only has the temple been compromised, but we keep reading it. In verse 10, it says, I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had, <coughs> had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, the wine and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses, Shilamiah, the priest, Zadok, the scribe, and Padiah of the Levites as their assistant, Hanan, the son of Zakur son of Mataniah, for they were considered reliable and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Okay, so what happened here? Well, not only does he find out that, that this enemy is occupying the house of God. And by the way, you guys, when you look at this and you go, how in the world could that high priest allow an enemy to occupy the house of God? You, re, you need to remember that our bodies are, are called what? A, a, a temple for the Holy Spirit. Some of us have an enemy occupying us we've allowed enemy occupation, right? Because we're, our bodies are a picture of the temple of the Holy Spirit. And for some of us, we've allowed an enemy to really take residence in our lives. And so he deals with it, but he doesn't just find it's happened there in the temple. What does he find out? He finds out that the Levites and the priests who are supposed to be taken care of by these tithes and offerings in order to minister to the people, they haven't, been, they haven't been receiving any of that. And so they're literally out in the fields taking second and third jobs, just trying to survive. And so he sees this. And once again, Nehemiah, he's losing it. He cannot believe this is going on. He can't believe that they've gotten to this point. So he brings them all in. And then he re, literally, he's like, no, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna like put four new treasurers over this to make sure the tithes and offerings are coming in and that they're going where they need to go. And so he reestablishes uh, that. Um, and then he confronts these leaders. And he says, you need to make this right. And he says, the people then started to bring the tithes and offerings uh, back. Then we get to verse 15, it says this. In those days, I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also who lived in the city brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil thing that you are doing profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers act in this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. As soon as it began to grow dark, at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. What? Did that? Yeah. Yep. He says, if you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Yep, Nehemiah, for some of you, just became your favorite Bible hero. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O oh my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. So the Jews had once again made this promise, this covenant with God that we're gonna honor the Sabbath. 
this day set aside for rest. We're not gonna do work. We're not gonna do business uh, on this day. Nehemiah is there. It's the Sabbath. And what he sees is just a mess. He says, he sees not only people doing business with Gentiles on the Sabbath, but he also sees people just doing their daily work on the Sabbath. Like it's just no big deal. And so what does he do? He orders that the gates were to be shut. He shuts down all business. He says, we're gonna shut the gates the night before and they're not gonna be open until after the Sabbath. And then he puts his men out there on duty, on guard. And we see these Gentile merchants who are used to doing business, right? On the Sabbath, because, because here's what the, the people had prioritized, right? They, prior, they prioritized, I need to get my work done. I need to make more money. And, and the Sabbath is another day, another opportunity to do that. And so they prioritized their wealth, their finances, their lifestyles over God's will. And these Gentiles were just feeding. Gentiles were making money. And so they're out there and they, and they would circle the wall probably because they were used to being able to bribe people to let them in so they could sell and make a profit. And Nehemiah himself is up on the wall and he's like, hey, what are you guys doing? Nothing. You guys need to go away. Well, they try and circle around a little bit more. And he's like, listen, if you don't go away, I'm going to come down there. I'm going to lay hands on you. We're going to throw down. And I've got, I've got a squad. Let's go. Right? And we see that they stopped. They were done at that point. And so once again, we see Nehemiah stepping in. And guys, I, I, I don't want us to be so amazed at how he confronts this to miss out on the fact that he confronts it. He confronts it. And then we see, lastly, in verses 23 through 31, it says, In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. He's going, that's why when someone says, I'm going to go Old Testament on you, you need to be afraid. That's why. <laughs> That's what they're saying, right? They're going to fight unfair. And I made them take an oath in the name of God saying, you shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. And he was beloved by his God and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sambalit, the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. <laughs> Remember them, O oh my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus, I cleanse them from everything foreign and I establish the duties of the priests and the Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, oh my God, for good. Okay, so there's been this compromise, right? In every one of these major areas, and now he sees that the compromise has way, made its way into the homes. He sees these marriages once again are compromised. Now, now when, it's, when it's talking about marrying foreign people, what, what it's, you need to understand this is not a racial thing. This is a situation where they're choosing to marry people who want nothing to do with God, who are against God. Their worship is against God. They worship foreign gods and, 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 and pagan gods. And so, and so when it, what it's talking about here, once again, is uh, over a period of time, which we don't know how long it took, all of a sudden they start compromising again in marriage and, and start marrying people they shouldn't. And you guys, when you start compromising in marriage, it always has a trickle-down effect. It always does. See, 
what, what, what you and I need to understand is this. Compromise wants to take over your life. Okay, compromise wants to take over your life. When, when, see, when we compromise, we're believing a lie. See, when we compromise, the lie that we tell ourselves and that we believe is what? This is just a one-time thing, right? This is just a one-time thing. Or, or this is a unique situation. I mean, this is unique. No one else has gone through this, right? Or, or, or this is so unique. I mean, if, if they were in my shoes, they would do the same thing, right? And what else do we do when we start to compromise? We minimize the consequences, don't we? We go, oh, well, the worst case is just this. Or, or uh, I mean, that may happen, but I don't think it will. But you guys, compromise always wants to take over. And ultimately, when we're talking about marriage, cons- compromise, it wants to take over your family. It wants to take your kids. And when it talks about these kids who are speaking a different language, we read that and we go, well, they should be honored. They're bilingual kids. That's amazing. Like, I wish my kid was bilingual. No, that's not what's happening here. What we're seeing is these kids are being taught pagan language, pagan culture, and they don't even know the Hebrew language. They don't even know how to read, and they're not being trained with the word of God. So they don't even know the word of God. They can't read the word of God and they can't participate in the services of worship to God. And so Nehemiah sees this and he is absolutely beside himself. This is the next generation. These are the, these are the future leaders of Israel. This is, this, is, uh, this is how the nation's gonna move forward well. It's gonna be through these kids, right? Through the discipleship of these kids. And yet he's seen this whole group of people, uh, these kids growing up, and they, they don't even know the language of the Bible. They don't even know how to participate in these worship services. And so Nehemiah goes nuts, right? It's okay. Now, listen, here's what I also want you to know. This is a righteous anger, okay? This is not permission for you to go home and to go nuts and be like, Nehemiah did, honey. Like, no, this is a righteous anger. This is an anger at what this is doing to the will of God, okay? And so he sees this and and literally he pulls these guys in and he plucks out their beards. Now, Now, you're like, that's just weird, but listen, the beard in those days was a source of pride. It was a pride for the people. In fact, in the book of Ezra, we see Ezra, he's so distraught, he pulls out his own beard. But Nehemiah's like, that didn't work out for Ezra. I'm gonna pull their beard. And so Nehemiah pulls out their beards um, and, and, he's, and he's literally like, bam, he's beating them. You're like, oh, it's in there. He is like, you are not going to do this. We are the set aside people of God. You are destroying the legacy. You're you're destroying everything that God wants to do moving forward. Stop. Stop. He reminds him of Solomon. He's like, remember Solomon, one of the greatest kings ever? What was his downfall? He's marrying these women that wanted nothing to do with God. And Solomon, who you're not smarter than, fell. It cost him everything. And we see that this issue, this intermarriage that was going on and had taken place all the way into the priesthood, right? We see it in the priesthood where they're they're marrying with with people that are against them, with enemies. This is all the way to the top. And so Nehemiah like is done. He is like, you're done. You're not a priest. And he's he's literally making sure whoever is serving as a spokesperson for God is qualified to do it. And so he literally clears the deck and and raises up the right people. He reestablishes the standards and the necessary rhythms of ministry and and, and, and giving that would create the lasting change that had to happen for the nation to move forward. And then he closes again with just prayer before God. You guys, this guy prayed. We see it all throughout this book. And guys, what, what, what I think is important for us to understand is this, a God-driven vision or burden, it is not 
a fad. It's not designed to just be a moment in your life. It's not designed to just be a mountaintop, right? It's not designed to be this camp experience. It's not designed to be this just, oh, I receive Christ as my Lord and Savior moment and then, and then I'm good, right? No, like uh, w- what we see is, is how compromise can happen so quickly in your life. You guys, compromise can happen on your walk to your car, right? I mean, uh, your walk to your car. Some of you are gonna be tempted to compromise, Right, and, and so it's always happening in your life. And so the question we gotta ask is, how do we guard the decisions we're making for Jesus? Right, how do we guard those things? How do we not just make it and, and, and make it a moment or, or we're all worshiping and I'm just caught up in that? How do I make that a lasting decision in my life? How do I bring faithfulness into that? And Nehemiah is like, these are the key pieces to establishing faithfulness in your life. And, and, and that was his concern. That was his focus for the people. And you guys, that's the thing we have to be focused on. And part of this as well, and this can be uncomfortable, but part of it is we gotta be willing to get in each other's business and confront each other out of love, right? And part of this is responding when I'm confronted, it's responding with humility and being able to receive that. Guys, um, I don't don't know what God is gonna call you to do, but some of you are gonna be called to be an initiator like Nehemiah. And God's gonna give you a burden of vision. He's just gonna go do that. Go lead that, right? But then... I don't want you to miss this. Some of you are going to be called to be one of those people in chapter 11 and 12. And God is going to call you to go somewhere, to stay somewhere, to be a part of something. And he's going to say, you just go all in there and you be present and allow me to use you in that. And the question is, will you and I be an active participant in the change that God wants to lead? and that God wants to see happen. Will we be a part of it? And I pray that you will. Guys, if you've never made a decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can't stress enough the importance of understanding that Jesus loves you so much that he saw you in this state of separation of sin and he sent He sent his own life. He came and he died for you and for me resurrected from the grave, having victory over that sin and death, that separation. And, 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 and he's provided a way, an avenue for you to have a relationship with him, a perfect and holy God. And so maybe that's the step. Maybe that's step one. But maybe it's something else. Maybe it's addressing an area of compromise. Maybe it's addressing an area uh, that, was, that was something you said, God, I'm gonna be all about this. But for whatever reason, it's not anymore. And you need to be reminded this morning, will I be an active participant in what God's called me to be and do? And it starts with getting myself right before him. Amen.